This is CBC Here and Now. You know, we all get older, but it's good to stay young at heart. Coming up on Here and Now, I'll introduce you to a business where go-karting and video games are just kid stuff. And today we take another step forward as we announce the new name for the current Women's Policy Office. We're here to announce the opening of the application process. A series of government announcements this week. But the Premier insists this isn't the election campaign. What's it like getting out of prison and wanting to start your life again but not having the financial means to do it? Coming up, we'll talk to you about local organizations that are helping incarcerated women get back on their feet. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Anthony Germain. And I'm Carolyn Stokes. The provincial government is firing out positive news releases this week. So far, there are five announcements. Here Now's Katie Breen has been tracking these announcements. So Katie, just what's in the works here? Well, it is an election year, but Ball says he's not campaigning. The string of announcements made this week is just his government doing work. The week starts out with Justice Minister Andrew Parsons behind the mic. I think it's something that can be done quickly. I think it's something that can be done before the next election. He announces an all-party committee on democratic reform. The group, he says, will review the electoral system, starting with campaign finance rules, like financial reporting by political parties and district associations. On Tuesday, two announcements. The first, new ferry contracts on the south coast of the island, saving the province close to $3 million. Then, the second announcement. We're here to announce the opening of the application process for the new Newfoundland and Labrador Community Transportation Program. A new grant for communities and groups to develop and implement an inclusive and accessible transportation service. Applicants can get up to $100,000 if they can prove volunteer involvement and sustainability. Yesterday, two more announcements. Government has decided to review the province's Schools Act, legislation that covers how schools in this province operate. It's 20 years old, and the province says a review will make sure it's all current. Well, good morning, everyone. Yesterday, the province announced a name change and a refined focus for the Office for the Status of Women. Key areas for the department are now the prevention of gender-based violence, advancing women in leadership, and stronger gender-based analysis across government work. Five good news government announcements in three days. And Ball says it has nothing to do with it being an election year. This is what I've been elected to do to improve the future of Newfoundland and Labrador. And this is what I'll continue to do to sometime we get into election in 2019, whenever that is. But I can tell you I'm not campaigning today. What I'm doing today is building on what I was elected to do in 2015. That brings us to today. No announcements so far, but there is one in the works. Government will be announcing its long-term plans on climate change in Cornerbrook tomorrow. Reporting live for Here and Now, I'm Katie Breen in the newsroom. Well, a new program is helping women who have been incarcerated get back on their feet. The program is designed to break down economic barriers faced by women recently released from custody. Here and Now's Meg Roberts has more. Imagine getting out of jail. You're ready to start your life again, except you have no money, no bank account, and no ID. The situation can be paralyzing, and that's why a new program being offered by Stella's Circle and the Newfoundland and Labrador Credit Union is aimed at helping women get a fresh start right here at the courthouse doors. Bus passes, an ID, and undergarments are just some of the items Cynthia wishes she could have purchased leaving prison. But now there is a program that can help women do exactly that. Newfoundland and Labrador Credit Union will set up bank accounts for women that don't have one. They will also be offering women $50 the day of their release or when they're out on remand to get back on their feet. It gives women, um, I guess, the power to look forward to something, to know that like when they are released that there's something there for them. And it's not, where am I going to sleep tonight? Where am I going to eat my, my meal? And it brings them back in the same circle that they've lived in. And, and a lot of girls I hear that don't want to live that life no more. And they want change, but they just can't do it because when they get out, there's nothing for them. Both the bank and Stella's circle believe this will help women stay out of prison. They have no choice but to maybe steal for some food, 
go back to their drug dealers if they've had a throw of addictions to possibly find money or a safe place to stay or transportation even to their next probation officer. It gives them a little sense of independence. They don't have to be in those places and on those streets. An outreach coordinator from Stella's Circle will sit at the courthouse to immediately help the women in need. Following that, a bank account will be opened under their name with $150 in the account. This is a three-year pilot project. The credit union will fund 20 women a year. Meg Roberts, CBC News, St. John's. A teenager in Stephenville heard his third and final decision in a series of sexual assault cases this morning. The identity of the accused teenager is protected by the Youth Criminal Justice Act. The judge gave the teen a conditional discharge after he pleaded guilty to sexual interference. He is to keep the peace and stay away from the teenage girl who was involved. The teenager's lawyer says the decision is fair and he says his client is ready to move on. In the first two trials, the teen was acquitted of sexual assault charges. To the Muskrat Falls inquiry now, where the Nunatsiavut government is learning for the first time about Nalcor and has commissioned studies that looked at methylmercury effects on wild food. Here now is Jacob Barker has that story. Nunatsiavut government representatives were on the stand today speaking about the part they played during construction and a lack of response from the government to environmental and indigenous concerns. Concerns which have been brought up before, even before the project got its final go-ahead. In general, any time additional scientific evidence has pre been presented back, they have deferred to NALCOR's experts on this. And so uh, it's very frustrating when you have independent experts and the government is making decisions not based on um, the best available knowledge on this project. The government has responded to some recommendations made by an independent committee, but when it comes to mitigation measures of methylmercury in the Muskrat Falls Reservoir, there has been no response. And there is division. Two out of three indigenous groups would like to see vegetation and capping of wetlands in the Muskrat Falls Reservoir. The most recent estimates of doing that are pegged at 400 to 700 million dollars. So there are some additional complexities as well on top of the financial component and the issue of where the money comes from within the budgetary system, correct? Reality of a mega project. When you're talking about the health of the local and indigenous population, I don't know how you can put a cost on that. Several scientific studies commissioned by NALCOR looking at the effects of methylmercury on country food were put into evidence at the inquiry. The reports contain information which contradicts science put forward by Nunatsiavut. The Nunatsiavut government had not seen them before today. I was not aware, Rod was not aware that there was additional work being done. So, you know, I, I would say that certainly that's the government would have looked at those reports if they were if they were aware of them. Water levels are set to rise in the Muskrat Falls Reservoir this fall. A short timeline if the government or NALCOR decides clearing measures are necessary. So right now what these officials want more than anything is an answer. Jacob Barker, CBC News, Happy Valley Goose Bay. Well, turning now to national politics, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's former top advisor has asked to testify at the Commons Justice Committee probing the SNC-Lavalin affair. Jerry Butts says he believes his evidence would be of assistance as the committee considers alleged interference into the decision to prosecute the Quebec-based company. In the meantime, Trudeau says he is still considering whether Jody Wilson-Raybould will remain in the Liberal caucus following her testimony yesterday in finance Minister Bill Morneau is defending his office against accusations of interference. The former attorney general says Morneau's chief of staff wrongly and repeatedly tried to sway her to settle the case even after she asked Morneau to put a stop to it. I want to be clear, I never raised this issue with Jody Wilson-Raybould. She approached me in the House of Commons to inform me that my staff was speaking to her staff, which I think is entirely appropriate. The role of my staff is to, with her team and with all teams, to talk about the importance of jobs, to make sure that we understand the economic consequences of our decision. That is what we do today. That's what we're going to do tomorrow. We'll continue to do this as long as we are representing Canadians. 
A Wilson Raybould leveled accusations of interference against 11 people in her appearance before the Commons Justice Committee, including against the Prime Minister. Now, he continues to deny any improper conduct. Members of Parliament will debate the issue in an emergency session of Parliament tonight. And stay tuned, uh, Julie Van Dusen will join us live from Ottawa to break this story down. That's coming up in about 20 minutes. A notorious child abuser originally from this province has been granted an escorted temporary absence from prison to attend his father's funeral here in Newfoundland. Donnie Snook is serving an 18-year prison sentence for sexually abusing boys here and in New Brunswick. His crimes shocked the community that once supported him. The CBC's Carissa Donkin reports. Well, Donnie Snook was last known to be serving his 18-year sentence in a prison in British Columbia, but this week he was transported to St. John's in his home province of Newfoundland and Labrador, where he'll be allowed to attend, quote, particular locations under the uh, escort of correctional officers at all times, and that's according to the Royal Newfoundland Constabulary, which was notified of Snook's arrival. Six years have passed since Snook's crimes shocked St. John. Grace Murphy used to be fond of Snook when they served hot lunch to underprivileged children together in St. John, but his crimes devastated her, and she doesn't agree with the decision to let him leave prison for his father's funeral. I'm sorry his father passed away, but I don't think it's right that he's allowed out of prison, whether it's escorted or unescorted, to be in the community to do anything. He should not be allowed out of prison till his 18 years is done. Snook admitted to abusing 17 boys in St. John over a span of 12 years. It was 46 charges in all that he admitted to, including sexual assault and extortion. He also admitted to three additional sex abuse charges involving a boy in Mount Moriah, Newfoundland, back in the mid-1990s. Snook will return to prison on Saturday following his father's funeral. Carissa Donkin, CBC News, Fredericton. It's pretty cold if you're heading out to fill up your cars, you probably noticed. Well, now another reason to gasp at the pumps, the price of gas is up. The Public Utilities Board raised the price by nearly two cents a litre. That puts the price of regular self-serve gas on the Northeast Avalon at just over $1.20 a litre. Well, Team Newfoundland and Labrador is celebrating two medal wins at the Canada Winter Games in Red, Red Deer, Alberta so far this week. Melanie Taylor topped her fellow figure skaters taking home the gold. The 30-year-old from Conception Bay South already has a bronze from previous games. And 15-year-old Emma Mullet of St. John's took home a bronze medal in judo yesterday. Team NL's Natalie Freak placed fifth in that event. The Canada Games continue until Sunday. Well now a pat on the back today for our colleagues at Land to Sea for accolades and recognition. That show here on CBC has been recognized for collecting, telling and preserving stories about the people of this province and their important relationship with the ocean. Land and Sea is this year's winner of the Turning the Tide Award for Historical Marine Significance. The awards were established in 2017 to not only acknowledge the economic impact the marine industry has on this province, but also to celebrate the industry's contribution to this province's history and culture. Land and Sea really encompasses uh, that library of storytelling, that, 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 that huge archive of, of history, uh, and has been bringing that into people's homes for 54 years. So that is truly significant. Well, other awards winners include OceanX, Fraser Edison, and a marine technology company in St. John's called Kraken Robotics Incorporated. The awards will be handed out at a gala at the Delta Hotel on April the 4th. Well, if you're planning to go out with friends this weekend, you could go to a restaurant or you could go to a bar, but there's a new kind of business where grown-ups get to play like their kids again. Thunderdome in Mount Pearl is part of a booming business trend called Eatertainment, and it's proving that adults are serious about having fun. Here and now, Zach Gowdy is there and joins us live. So, Zach, what is Thunderdome all about? Hey, just give me a second to... Finish my game here. One moment, uh, Carolyn. I'm gonna. Uh, oh, I, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, I'm in the video arcade portion of Thunderdome, and I think you know this is where you might normally find a lot of the little ones. 
But these days, games and businesses where games are the main attraction aren't just for kids. In fact, in the growing category of businesses called entertainment, adults are the main customers. Let me show you what I mean. In other parts of the Thunderdome, they have axe throwing, pool, virtual reality, and a fully licensed bar. And that'll tell you everything you need to know about the kind of customers they have coming in at this business. Now, Thunderdome has been operating for a little more than a year. It's owned by husband and wife duo, Walter Matina and Kylie Hickey. And Kylie's with me here now at the Thunderdome main event, which is the high-speed go-kart track. Hey, Kylie, nice to see you. Hey. Um, Why don't you tell me a little bit about how you realized that a business like this had the potential to attract more than just little kids? Um, well, we have a lot of square footage and we spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to best utilize it. We focused on the adults in the beginning and it was really obvious pretty quick that, you know, we had a business that everybody was going to love. Um, definitely not just for kids, but also for adults. Now you guys started out with a go-kart track in Torbay. Uh, I guess you pretty quickly realized who the main customers were, who was coming to put down the money. Were yeah. you surprised by the age of the people that the Thunderdome and the G-Force karting was attracting at that time? I wasn't surprised by it because we managed to pull off a liquor license, which was like a huge score for us. Um, and that solidified what we needed to do. Um, it made us focus on services that were going to fulfill adults. And, you know, the ones we already had, adults love. So once we got some pool tables and met Jack Axes, Adrian Beaton, it was a very quick and very natural growth on the adult side. These days you guys are hosting stag parties and corporate events and all of these yeah. adult oriented uh, entertainment options. Yeah. What are the kind of reactions that you get as old people, older people like myself, yeah. come in here and slip into a go-kart or play an arcade game yeah. and, and start to have fun in that way again? Yeah. You know, you can hear them laughing down the, the hallways and throughout the building. It's a really exhilarating experience. Um, you know, the, the corporate market love it. We literally have everything they need. And the stag parties, it's like, it, it's everything they need right before they head downtown, you know, for the big night. So it, it's great. <laughs> It's a wonderful thing you've got going here. Do you mind if I get a little thrill on here? I'm going to join the kart race. I'd love to see you race it out with the boys, yeah. I don't know if I'm going to come number one, but uh, in another part of this business, they've just formed, and you heard Kylie mention it, a partnership with Jack Axes, another business has gotten to be a big part of the entertainment scene in St. John's. Coming up in the next half hour of here and now, I'm going to take a little spin out of the axe throwing lane. As soon as I buckle up for safety here. Yeah. There we go. Ah, there we go. Safety first, even for an older person like myself. All right, well, coming up on here now, we'll take you back to the Funder Dome. We'll check out the axe throwing lane next, but for now, let me see if I get my cart on. Reporting live, I'm Zach Gowdy. Woo! Oh, yeah! Well, in about 15 minutes, an exciting decision we made for book lovers in the province. Joining me now to talk about it, Stephanie Tobin. She's a digital writer with CBCNL and, of course, Fred Hutton, host of the St. John's Morning Show. Stephanie, start with you. What's going on? <laughs> uh, so there's uh, four advocates, four books, four local authors all over at the AC Hunter Library tonight vying for NL Reads 2019's winning title. Okay, and those books are? Uh, so we've got Most Anything You Please by Trudy Morgan Cole, mm -hmm. Something for Everyone by Lisa Moore, uh, the End of Music by Jamie Fitzpatrick, and uh, Boat People by Sharon Bella. All right, so obviously an exciting contest. Mr. Hutton, what's your role in all this? I'm the referee and host, so i got to make sure that these advocates for each book, uh, you know, are forceful with their arguments, but I have to make sure that they... Uh, I guess put forth their arguments in such a way that people can vote there and it's right up until the very end and at the end they will actually tabulate the votes which have been gone on, done online. Folks there tonight can also vote and it's open to the public at 6.30. You do have to register so you've got a couple minutes to do it. Mm -hmm. And basically this part of NL Reads is just to promote local authors. I mean we're in the news from here all the time getting books from local authors dropped on our desks all the time. Yeah. There's so much out there, so much great literature to read, and it's all produced right here. Mm -hmm. and of course, a lot of you have to pay for those books, but that's <laughs> the way it goes. Uh, what's the whole significance of this event? 
Uh, I think it's just around like really promoting local authors and all the local talent that we've got right here. Like there's so many books in the world that you can read, but there are people right here who are writing great, great novels that you can grab a copy of anytime. All right. Well, listen, appreciate the update, and I uh, hope you both have a great time over at the library. Thank you very much. I'll try to play, play nice. Yeah. Oh, yes, I'm the referee. I'll bring my whistle. Thanks, Anthony. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, I've had hard times in my life when I could hardly feed my family, so I know what it's like to be there. Sue LeBlanc turned those hard times into a national movement. Up next, her inspirational story shows that one person really can make a difference. This weather forecast is brought to you by Newfoundland and Labrador Tourism. 5,000 kilometers of groomed trails are waiting to be explored. Embrace winter today. Okay, get to the uh, wintry weather details uh. in just a moment. I want you to check something out, though. We got some video today from the West Coast showing just how much snow has piled up. Oh, wow. This is from Wiltondale, a town just south of Grossmourne National Park, an area that got hit with a lot of snow. Yeah, apparently. <laughs> yeah. And particularly, you know, those drifts with all the wind uh, wow. that's been happening out there. Just snow up to the eaves of the houses. Yeah, you're in that snow blower that Katie Breen was showing us the St. John's <laughs> International Airport. Like, you need that sucker to get that rid of that snow. That, yeah. That's right up to the eaves of the house, right? Yeah. So, wow. Right. Amazing. And, you know, that wind is going to continue uh, for that area for this evening. There's actually a blowing snow advisory okay. in place from the right. West So Coast. maybe get rid of those drifts. <laughs> yeah, blow it around some more. Yeah. 
All right, well, let's have a look at uh, the satellite and radar shot. Things really still unsettled. Uh, you can have a look there on the west coast to see what's happening there now. Still some uh, snow coming down, lots and lots of wind. That's a blowing snow advisory I was telling you about. That's for the entire uh, west coast. And we also have this wind warning in place for the Port of Basque area, as well as uh, the north uh, east or the eastern portion of the northern peninsula. So winds very strong uh, there tonight, gusting up to 100. If you're driving in these areas, Try not to, I guess. <laughs> Stay home if you can, because the drifting is pretty bad out there. Uh, some of the clearing equipment was having problems. So yeah, try not to drive if you don't have to. We also have this blizzard warning still in effect for the McCovic and Hopedale area. An additional five to 10 centimeters of snow could fall there tonight. And for McCovic, that's on top of the 38 centimeters of snow they got last night. And pair that with high winds and uh, yeah, not very nice conditions there this evening for sure. And this is how it's going to play out. You can see the rest of the island looking fairly clear tonight, but it's staying pretty windy. It was windy today. It's going to continue to be windy tonight in the east. That's snow continuing for the west coast and up along the coast of Labrador. So for tonight, temperatures very chilly, and there are those winds, westerly winds, 40 gusting to 70. Also very windy along the south, uh, the northeast coast there and the northern peninsula. Temperatures in St. John's minus 10 overnight, but with that wind chill, it's going to be feel more like minus 26. So very cold night tonight as well. Only about two centimeters of snow expected for the west coast of Corner Brook area. And of course, Port of Basque staying very windy tonight and into tomorrow along the coast. There's that additional five to 10 centimeters that could fall tonight and wind staying strong as well. Uh, northwesterly wind 50 gusting to 70 and Lab City staying quite chilly with that wind chill minus 30 six overnight tonight. So as we get into Friday, things are clearing on the island. A few patches of light flurries uh, for some areas. That's the potential there. And uh, flurries continuing for the west coast of Labrador. But overall, it's looking fairly uh, clear. A mix of sun and cloud for the St. John's area, Clarenville, Bonavista. But a chance of some light flurries along the southern areas here. That wind chill is going to stay very cold, minus 21. And the winds are going to stay strong tomorrow. So it may, you may see some sunshine, but it's going to be windy with gusts up to 70. For central areas, similar story not quite as windy but a mix of sun and cloud possibility of some flurries along the south coast in Harbor Breton for the west coast another two centimeters of snow there wind chill sitting at around minus 18 and uh, some sun and cloud in the Burgio area tomorrow as we get into the straight some sunshine for Lancelou could see some flurries for the Port of Schwa area not a whole lot and a chance of some flurries for Mary's Harbor and Cartwright only about two centimeters of snow expected there and for the rest of Labrador we're looking at Mikovic, a few flurries there, minus 10 as the high, and a few flurries for Happy Valley Goose Bay and staying cold in Lab West with a minus 24 uh, wind chill. Now we are keeping an eye on another system that's coming into next week, so I'll get into those details in the extended forecast. Anthony? Well, thanks, Karen. Now it may sound corny, but our next story shows how one person really can make a difference. It's from a middle school in a small town in Nova Scotia, a place where one woman's selflessness and dedication to healthy eating has inspired students and maybe even kick-started a national movement. Colleen Jones now with that story. Are you guys all on track? Meet Sue LeBlanc, whipping together lunch for about 140 kids at Chester Area Middle School. People are chopping, grating, and whipping up homemade salad dressing. On the menu today, every kid's favorite. Well, from scratch hamburgers, there's um, veggies pureed in there with them. Who said there's no such thing as a free lunch? There's the burgers and a to-die-for salad bar. And the kicker, for February, the kids all eat for free. As cafeteria lady, Sue noticed some kids didn't eat as well as others. Not all of the students could access the healthy food that we were offering. Inspired to create change, Sue started writing grants, looking for donations. She had the support of the school and the school board, and she hasn't earned a nickel this whole month, choosing to put her money into the program. 
took your money that you make as cafeteria lady yep and you put it into the program for the kids that just almost makes me cry but anyhow uh, why? so well i've had hard times in my life when i could hardly feed my family so i know what it's like to be there i felt like this was a really great opportunity for the students to have this time where they all had access to the same thing. And I knew the ball had to start somewhere, so I knew that's something I could give. That ball is rolling as the kids pour into the lunchroom, grabbing their burgers and off to load up on the salad bar, experimenting with chickpeas and beets, loving cabbage. It's really good. It's, it's, it's like that there's options like for like really different cool. things. There's different things every day. Some kids maybe don't eat that well, you know, but it's like this program really helps kids start to eat better. Many kids admit before this month-long pre-program, they didn't always make wise food choices with their lunch money. I bought chips for my snack. Jennifer Lemire is the school's vice principal. They're talking about healthy foods now. Um, students are putting beets, uh, shredded beet on their salads and loving it. And chickpeas. And chickpeas. The free program ends at the end of the week, but there is a move afoot led by a national group to have the federal government cost share a universal healthy school food plan. Who knows when something like that might happen, if ever. But in Chester, Nova Scotia, for a month, this woman made it happen. Colleen Jones, CBC News, Chester. This included in-person conversations, telephone calls, emails, and text messages. Jody Wilson-Raybould says many people tried to interfere in criminal charges against SNC-Levelin. Tonight, MPs will hold an emergency debate in the House of Commons to discuss it. But first, our very own Julie Van Dusen will join us to break it all down.
Going to head to Parliament Hill now. From a trace of smoke to a roaring inferno, within just three weeks, reports of illicit attempts to intervene in the prosecution of Montreal-based SNC-Lavalin have fully engulfed the Prime Minister. Yesterday's sometimes incendiary Justice Committee testimony by his former Attorney General, Jody Wilson-Raybould, suggests to some a government that's in flames. And yet, Justin Trudeau insists he acted within the rule of the law. Julie Van Dusen is following today's developments in Ottawa, and she joins me now. What a story in federal politics. Mm -hmm. What turn did things take today, Julie? Well, I mean, you almost have to take it party by party. I can tell you one thing. The Liberals look shell-shocked. You, you heard a lot of that very long uh, testimony full of stunning details yesterday. Well, they have to absorb it, and it's a lot more personal for them. And, of course, the bad headlines from one end of the country to the other. So a lot of them were grim-faced and not wanting to talk about it uh, too much. And now Gerald Butts the Prime Minister's former key advisor who quit 10 days ago from PMO saying he had done nothing wrong, he's indicated to the Justice Committee that he wants to give his version of events. Uh, yesterday, Jody Wilson-Raybould said that Butts was one of those amongst uh, the PMO staff who uh, pressured her to uh, cut SNC-Lavalin some slack and, and help them avoid criminal prosecution. And, of course, she said she resisted pressure. Um, for, for the Conservatives and the NDP, of course, this is a big gift, Anthony, as we are months away from an election. So let's take a listen to a prime minister in damage control, followed by the opposition. There are disagreements in perspective on this, but I can reassure Canadians that we were doing our job and we're doing it in a way that respects and defends our institutions. The Prime Minister has breached the public trust. He has repeatedly failed to come and be straight with Canadians. He has repeatedly lied about these matters. It's twisting the rules and the law for your own personal and political interests. This is incredible. Well, I know we're heading towards a break, or the MPs are, Julie. It's hard to imagine this is going to actually die down. Uh, take out the Van Dusen crystal ball here. What, what, should we, <laughs> what should we expect? Well, the pressure will continue on the Prime Minister. There's too many kind of tentacles in this story to let it slip away. Uh, the Conservatives, of course, have asked for the Prime Minister's resignation. Well, that hasn't happened, but they've sent a letter to the RCMP uh, asking the force to investigate the whole SNC-Lavalin affair. The NDP want a public inquiry. The Liberals, well, they have to deal with the nuts and bolts first. What, did, what to do with Jody Wilson-Raybould after her very damning testimony yesterday? Does she stay in or out of caucus? They have a lot to think about, and they're clearly struggling with all of this. Take a listen. Times it's a, politics is about making a, a, a hard decision or a different hard decision. It's not about there's a right and wrong. And there was some differences of opinion about how to go. So, Anthony, there is an emergency debate in the Commons tonight that will probably go quite late on the whole affair. And Gerald Butts, of course, indicating that he wants to testify at the Justice Committee. Well, this story, with all of its twists and turns, is far from over. All right, uh, Julie, appreciate that. Thank you very much. You're welcome. That's our senior reporter in Ottawa, Julie Van Dusen. Well, we're going to go back out to Thunderdome in Mount Pearl, a business that's part of a growing trend called Eatertainment. Another business that's riding this wave is Jack Axes, where you can enjoy a pint and throw axes at a target. Well, now these two businesses are teaming up here. Now, Zach Audi is at Thunderdome and joins us now live. So, Zach, can we uh, ask you what's going on? You can ask me anything you like, <laughs> Carolyn. Uh, of course, Jack Axes, business well known by now, another big part of this eatertainment category. Downtown success story is moving uptown with a new location here at Thunderdome. Adrian Beaton is the axe man. Yep. Uh, Adrian, when you wanted to open a new Jack Axes location, why did you decide to do it here at Thunderdome rather than opening a standalone business, a new location? Honestly, uh, well, we were really interested in coming out to like the suburbs and bringing axe throwing out there because we thought there was a great market for it out there. And Thunderdome was somebody that was already kind of hitting the exact type of people that we really wanted to engage with anyways, and they were doing it in a great way. Go-karting, VR, and all these other things. We thought, why not add uh, axe throwing to the mix? Adrian, it's been a couple of years since you uh, came into this business scene with axe throwing. 
at the time you started, it was kind of a new thing, you know, <laughs> axes and pints, is this going to fly? Are you surprised with how fast this has really caught on in this market? Definitely, definitely very surprised. I mean, you say uh, it was kind of a new idea. It was a controversial idea when it first came up. Uh, it exploded way more than we ever thought it was going to, and it's uh, that's not unique to here. It's been all over the world. I mean, literally, it's been on ESPN, and it's going to continue. It's going to be on that again. Like, the competition and sports side of it's really exploded, and I think that's really what's propelling it forward. And I'll ask you also, why do you think that today's adult uh, consumers are looking for socialization options outside the traditional bar, restaurant dichotomy? Well, for me personally, I think the answer is it gets boring after a while. It's the same thing over and over, and uh, I think people are really shifting to a more, uh, they want experiences more so than they just want to go and drink their faces off. Uh, speaking of experiences, you want to have a little competition right quick? Obviously. All right, man, you go first. <laughs> oh, crap. All right, okay, first. here we go. Adrian Beaton, Jack Axes. Oh, my God, a three. I don't know about this, guys. Is it too late to cut? Oh, we're live. Okay, hold on now. One, two, three. Oh, not bad. I'm just happy it got on target. Awesome. Good to talk to you, Adrian. Thank you. And again, we're here at Thunderdome, recently partnered up with Jack's, Jack Axes. And uh, take it from me, this is every bit as much fun as it looks. Reporting live for here now, I'm Zach Gowdy in Mount Pearl. Our hearts and souls are still in Haiti. Music for medicine. How doctors and nurses are raising money to help patients in Haiti. And address mental health care needs here at home. Welcome back to Here and Now. I have the pleasure this Saturday night, I'll be here at Holy Heart Theatre for quite the event. It's a fundraiser for two wonderful causes. Dr. Andrew Freery from Broken Earth, Team Broken Earth, joins me now to talk about that. Uh, big night coming up. I just want to ask you first, uh, some problems in Haiti of late. Yeah. Any thoughts on what's been going on in that island country? Of course, yeah, many thoughts. Um, our hearts and souls are still in Haiti. and. Of course, as your listeners and viewers probably know, there's been absolute civil unrest down there on the streets of Port-au-Prince and even in the rural areas of uh, Haiti, which is unusual. And uh, we had a team on the ground uh, in Port-au-Prince and had to evacuate them because of the uh, because of the civil unrest right. um, straight from the hospital to the airport. Um, so it's not a good situation there now. We're in communication with the people that we talk to all the time there. You know, we've got great friends over the past 10 years that live in Port-au-Prince. They, they say things are settling, but there's a feeling of uh, significant fragility down right, there right now. Yeah. 
Well, let's hope things settle down because obviously you and your team are going to want to go back to Haiti. So let's talk about Haiti as one of the fundraisers for Saturday night. So tell yeah. me about this the show that apparently I'm involved in. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're hosting. Yeah, you're the right. MC. Uh, it's a great show. Uh, it's called Music is Medicine, and we're kind of uh, incorporating some great medical musical talent. I mean, uh, it's part of it is to showcase the fact that there's significant musical talent within the h halls and walls of the hospitals, and people only see us in our white coats and see right. the nurses and giving them medications, but they're incredibly talented people there. And so they decided to put together, we decided to put together a fundraiser that had we'd done 10 years ago, but this has rejuvenated it now, mm -hmm. called Music is Medicine, where you get to see some of your doctors and nurses and medical staff perform, along with some other performers uh, throughout the great talent in St. John's and surrounding areas. Okay, so I mentioned uh, Team Broken Earth, obviously one of the beneficiaries of whatever we managed to raise on Saturday night. It's not the only group, though. Um, the other has to do with mental health. You want to talk about that a bit? Absolutely. Uh, so the other cause, we're splitting the funds between Team Broken Earth, as you suggested, and a Dollar a Day Foundation. And the Dollar a Day Foundation was started here in St. John's as a national charity by myself, Alan Doyle, and Brendan Paddock. And it's, uh, it's a, a foundation where we ask people to contribute to a dollar a day, mm -hmm. very simple. Uh, and we take the funds and we uh, give it to foundations and charities throughout the country that are helping on the front lines of, of mental health and addiction services that just don't have sometimes the money they need to get the job done. There's okay. gaps in the system and we want to fill the gaps. All right, well, I look forward to Saturday night. Uh, as far as you go, uh, a cappella solo, what can we expect from Dr. Fury? I might, uh, you may see me uh, playing tickle a bit of, tickle the ivories a little bit. Yeah. All right, well, Dr. Fury, thank you very much. Thanks very much. Well, it's going to be quite the night, and some of the acts at this uh, Music His Medicine Variety Show, I love these names, mm -hmm. the uh, Flu Fighters House Band, which, you know, doctors, <laughs> many other performers, uh, Michelle Good. Doyle, Lady Cove Women's Choir, and many, many others. Yeah, money raised will be split between Team Broken Earth for the work it does in Haiti and the Dollar a Day Foundation that gathers funds to support mental health treatment. Now, it's happening this Saturday at Holy Heart Theatre starting at 730 Tickets are $35, and there are still some left. Mm -hmm. All you have to do is uh, head to the box office, holyheartheater.com, and get your tickets. It'll be a lively night with some musical surprises, and you can help out, as Carolyn said, to great causes. A glimmer of hope today for an end to escalating tensions between Pakistan and India over the disputed region of Kashmir. Pakistan's Prime Minister says a captured Indian pilot is going to be released tomorrow. More after the break.
This weather update is brought to you by Beltone, helping the world hear better. Welcome back. Yeah, so it was one of those days you open up the door of the car, whoosh, mm -hmm. and uh, kind of dangerous. Yeah, you need to kind of put your head down into the wind. Yeah, uh, yeah very windy, and it's going to stay windy tomorrow uh, and on Saturday in the St. John's area, and then things should start to ease as we get into Saturday. So, so far, Saturday is looking not okay. too bad. I'll Let's have it. a look at the extended forecast, starting with the current wind chill. It's windy out there, and it is cold with the wind chill, particularly in Lab City, minus 30 right Right now uh, with that wind chill. Uh, yeah, very, very cold. So quick look at these watches and warnings. The entire West Coast under a blowing snow advisory. Driving conditions really terrible uh, in that area. Also very windy on the Northern Peninsula East and down in Port of Basque uh, tonight and into tomorrow. Blizzard warning continues for the Makovic and Hopedale area. Could see another five to 10 centimeters there uh, tonight and into tomorrow. So tomorrow we're looking at a mix of sun and cloud for most most of the island could see some flurries along the south coast. Two centimeters of snow for the Corner Brook area, but those winds are going to stay strong again. Uh, westerly winds, 40 gusting to 70. And for Labrador, we're looking at uh, windy conditions still uh, for the morning and afternoon for the coastal areas, particularly in the Makovic area. Uh, but that should start to, to ease. Looking at a high of uh, minus 15 in Lab City tomorrow with some lighter winds there. So Saturday, this is how things are going to play out. We're looking at largely a mix of sun and cloud on the island. A chance of some flurries for parts of Labrador. Minus 14 as the high in Lab City on Saturday. Temperatures on the island between minus 7 and uh, minus 3. So things are, are looking pretty good in terms of precipitation, but uh, it should stay fairly windy uh, on Saturday. And then by the time we get into Saturday night, things should finally start to ease off. Not great news. I, I know if you're sick of all of this wind. So as we get into uh, Sunday night or Saturday night into Sunday morning, a few things keeping an eye on. There is a system that's uh, just working its way to the south of the island. So still questionable about whether or not that's going to track any more north and possibly bring some snow to the Avalon Peninsula. And then once that's gone, there is another system that's heading our way on Monday afternoon. Still a ways out. Don't really know how it's going to play out, but right now the, the guidance is saying that we could see some snow uh, to start Monday overnight into Tuesday. Could turn to some rain for the Avalon Peninsula and for parts of Central and some snow for Labrador and the West Coast. So still uncertain about how exactly that's going to play out and how much we might see, but uh, that's how it's looking so far. So this is a look at your five day forecast as we head into the weekend, a chance of some uh, flurries uh, for Sunday and a mix of sun and cloud on uh, Monday and then that snow to rain potential for uh, uh, for Tuesday, similar story for central areas uh, next week and for the western portion of the island, some flurries and so, uh, turning to snow on Monday night. Heading up into Labrador, not a bad weekend. Uh, Sunday looking like a mix of sun and cloud as well as on Monday, chance of some flurry action there on Tuesday and a mix of sun and cloud on Monday and Tuesday with some very chilly temperatures for western Labrador. So that's your forecast. Anthony, back to you. Thanks, Carol. To national news now that might keep Newfoundland MP Seamus O'Regan, Minister responsible for Indigenous Services, a little busy. Ottawa has announced an overhaul of the Indigenous child welfare system, and a key part of the legislation is keeping Indigenous kids in their own communities. Puts the best interest of Indigenous children at the forefront. Setting out flexible pathways for Indigenous communities to meet the needs of children and their families. More than half of all children currently in foster care are Indigenous, and most fall under the authority of provincial systems. If passed, Bill C-92 will put Indigenous governments in control of those services for First Nations, Métis and Inuit children. Advocates have welcomed the new approach, but they're also waiting to see how funding for this new system is going to work. In international news, U.S. President Donald Trump vows to keep talking to North Korea after a nuclear summit that failed to reach an agreement. Now, here's why, according to Mr. Trump. wanted the sanctions lifted in their entirety, and we couldn't do that. They were willing to denuke a large portion of 
the areas that we wanted, but we couldn't give up all of the sanctions. North Korea's foreign minister disputes that, claiming they only wanted some sanctions lifted. The second summit between Trump and Kim Jong-un ended abruptly, with a proposed deal signing ceremony canceled and both leaders heading home early. A third meeting isn't planned yet. India and Pakistan both accused the other of violating a ceasefire agreement today after heavy shelling along the contested border in Kashmir. It's the latest escalation in hostilities in the region. On Tuesday, Indian warplanes attacked what they called militant camps in Pakistan. The airstrikes were launched in retaliation for bombing two weeks ago that killed 40 Indian paramilitary police in Kashmir. But as Thomas Degler reports, there is a glimmer of hope the situation will be brought under control soon. Well, this could signal a potential de-escalation of tensions in the disputed region of Kashmir. Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan has announced in Parliament in Islamabad that his military will release tomorrow the Indian Air Force pilot who was shot down and captured yesterday. Khan calls it a peace gesture. Now, that pilot had unwittingly become the symbol of increased tensions between India and Pakistan ever since Pakistan said it shot down two warplanes yesterday and captured that Indian pilot and then released pictures of the man in custody. Uh, Indians took to the streets today marching and praying for his release from detention. Today's development, though, does not mean the confrontation is over. In fact, India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi struck a defiant tone addressing supporters today. Keep in mind, Modi is facing elections in the spring and he is keen to appear tough on terrorism. He vowed today the enemy won't be allowed to raise a finger, his words. Question is, though, should that be considered rhetoric for his domestic audience or a real threat? It's a thin line when tensions heat up and rivals such as India and Pakistan keep nuclear arsenals at the ready. Thomas Dagg, with CBC News, London. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was at the Canadian Space Agency headquarters in Quebec today, not to escape his problems on Earth, but to announce a new mission. Canada is going to the moon. 
Trudeau said Canada will be part of NASA's new Lunar Gateway Project, an outpost that will orbit the moon, allowing astronauts to conduct lunar expeditions. It'll also set the stage for future travel to Mars. Canada's contribution will be developing a robotic system to be known as Canadarm3, which will help repair and maintain the outpost. Trudeau brought his daughter Ella Grace along for the announcement as well as a tour. He says Ottawa's investment will create jobs, research and interest in Canada's space industry. Here's our viewer photo of the day. Lots of ice wow. along the coastline. And I did choose this one for a reason, actually, Anthony, because okay. this is an area that is dear to your heart. Okay, Eastport Peninsula somewhere. Ah, oh, oh. Close. Eastport. Ah Looking towards Salvage. Finally, she gives me a mulligan. <laughs> I needed that. Yeah, so uh, thank you so much to Tracy Batcher for sending this in. Uh, I see eSport. If you have a photo uh, you'd like to see on the news, please email it to us at nlphotos at cbc.ca. Won't be long. I'll be swimming there. Oh. Hard to believe. Oh, wow. Yeah. You got a while anyway. yet. <laughs> Thank you for the easy photo for a change. Uh, thanks a lot for watching tonight, and we'll be back tomorrow, and we'll see you then. Good night, everyone. Bye now.